I am not your normal instructor. I am Kirsten, you probably said that. Um, I have little notes packets for you, so if you did not get that, this is not available to you on eCourseWare. So make sure that you grab one of these. I will pass them around again. It's just copies of the slides, so you don't have to write down all of the definitions or quotes or anything. Um, so since it's not on eCourseWare, you won't need your laptop. So like Joyce said, I am currently getting my PhD here. I'm already an instructor. I've had a couple of years in oral communication before. Uh, but I am getting ready to teach health communication, so I get the opportunity to be evaluated by Joy. And if you have any feedback, I'm definitely welcome to that as well. Uh, my master's thesis was about direct-to-consumer advertisements for the birth control pill and the perceptions of risk. So it kind of lends itself really well to what we're going to talk about today, which is media effects and health communication. So when I was little, I loved Halloween. I don't think you understand, I loved <laughs> Halloween. And my mom is amazing, so we had all sorts of traditions, and even while she was going through grad school or law school or had a full-time job, she still managed to adhere to these traditions, such as making my costume or making sure she was home in time to take me trick-or-treating. And after we got back from trick-or-treating, we would sit down, and we would lay out all the candy, and we would inspect it. Which sounds like so much fun, right? No. So in the 90s, there was a news article that talked about how people were finding razor blades in candy, people were finding poison in candy, nails, all sorts of objects that should probably not be in candy, right? So we had to sit down and we had to dig through it. And it turns out that was actually misinformation. The media picked it up. It ended up being kids putting some of these items in candy. One of the really, really sad stories was a parent that ended up poisoning their own child. But it perpetuated like crazy, and all of my friends' parents did the exact same thing. So this really speaks to how media has the ability to influence behaviors, attitudes, and sometimes not correctly. Right? So today we have a couple of objectives. The first one is to discuss some of the common theoretical perspectives associated with media effects, and then the second is to examine the three ways that media influence health through news reporting, specifically advertising and entertainment. Questions so far? So the first theories that we're going to go over real quick are the traditional theories. The first one being agenda setting. And agenda setting talks about how the media covers certain stories more often than other stories. So it's really just telling the public what to think about. So what health issues have you seen covered most in the news? Any guesses? Yeah? Flu. Flu. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. Diabetes. <laughs> it took me longer than I can trip it to make this. Yeah. Heart disease. Heart disease. High blood pressure. It's a good one. Yeah? Uh, lung cancer. Lung cancer is a good one too. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> That's what happens when I get too excited. So 
So policies was the first one. 16.3% of the news stories talked about health care policies. Cancer, tuberculosis, diabetes and obesity, heart disease, HIV and AIDS, and autism. This was information from a Pew Research study done in 2008. So it's a little outdated. They haven't done more research on this recently, which is a little weird, on the different media coverage. What do you think should be on here that isn't? Well, let's say... There is no eight. Uh, they just wouldn't let me tell you that. <laughs> Alzheimer's, yeah. What's really big in the South right now? Related to prescription medications. Overdoses, opioids, yeah, absolutely. That could be something that is covered pretty frequently in the news that is not on here. So things that are related to previous outbreaks like tuberculosis in 2008, there was that traveler that had tuberculosis, tried to bring it back to the United States. So that came up a lot in the media. Today, tuberculosis probably wouldn't be on there, right? And autism might be flipped in favor of um, mental health in general, okay? Absolutely. So what is featured through the media agenda has the ability to change throughout depending on what environment we're in. So in conjunction with agenda setting, there is priming theory. And priming takes it a step further in that the topics with more coverage just don't exist more often. They also influence what we know. Uh, so it's considered an extension of agenda setting, and it focuses on the way media coverage makes certain issues and ideas more accessible by covering them more often. So like your textbook said, uh, news stories might feature things like uh, tobacco prevention or uh, diet over using sunblock to address cancer, right? You can pick which preventative measures are going to be featured more often and thus influence the public, right? So unlike agenda setting, which focuses on the importance of the attributed issues, priming focuses on how media influences content and evaluation of those issues. So I have a couple of news articles for you. What are we supposed to think about for this news article?
So now that we know that media selects certain stories more often, agenda setting, and that those stories influence how we think about a topic, <coughs> which is priming, uh, we can talk a little bit more about framing. So these are two articles from the Washington Post that were actually featured right on top of each other, which made my life so much easier. So they're talking about the exact same thing, the HIV AIDS Council being fired, but in two very different ways. How are they different? extends out to an entire community of people in general. It's just a very, it's kind of a wide jump, I think. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, so what community? Uh, the LGBTQ community. Yeah. So they are very much targeting the LGBTQ community in the first one. The second one, a little bit more general, right? Um, both use the word fires. Both use the words HIV and AIDS but two very different messages. And that's because stories are framed differently for different political affiliations, different races, different genders, different sexual orientations. Each of these stories are aimed at getting to a different group of people. Uh, I also looked for a version of this story on the national versus local level because they are framed differently in those manners as well. But all of these, didn't feature that story, which I thought was very interesting. So either they deleted it, or they just never talked about it in Memphis, which is very odd. Why? We're number six, right? Um, <laughs> We're okay. six on the most likely to contract HIV list, and they didn't talk about the HIV AIDS Advisory Council being fired. That's absolutely insane, right? So the media has the ability to control what the population knows about. They may not have learned about this, right? So next we're gonna jump into a couple of learning theories. As far as the media, uh, the two most important ones are cultivation theory, which talks about how stories, usually narratives, usually television, that are told in the media shape how we view the world. And also social cognitive theory, which says that we learn by <coughs> observing others. So in conjunction, these stories show how the media has the ability to influence our values, thinking, attitudes, behaviors, uh, by modeling behaviors through observational learning. And these are both positive and negative behaviors. And Sesame Street is famous for doing this. Absolutely. 